Good afternoon, and welcome to the Association of Research Libraries webinar on live call results and practical applications. I'm Amy Yeager, Public Relations Program Officer at ARL, and I'm joined by Angela Papalardo, ARL Program Coordinator for Events and Finance, and the Live Call Survey Liaison, and Michael Maciel, Senior Data Analyst at Texas A&M University Libraries. Uh, before we begin, there are a few housekeeping items to mention. All participants' lines have been muted to cut down on background noise. But there's a chat box in the lower, right, um, lower left hand corner of your screen. And if you have questions, type them in there. Um, at the end of the uh, webinar, we'll have a question and answer session. Um, and uh, we'll answer any questions that come in. But feel free to type them in as you think of them. Um, this webinar is being recorded. And we'll, we will make the uh, recording available to Amical, and um, you'll get further instructions from them on um, how to access it once it's available. Uh, so now I'd like to turn the presentation over to Angela Papalardo. Hi, everyone. I'm Angela Papalardo. Thank you for joining us. Today I'll be giving a brief overview of the survey components and uh, customization, as well as the steps to run a survey. And then I'll also briefly discuss interpreting the survey results before uh, turning it over to Michael Maciel, who will provide examples of practical applications from Texas A&M. LiveQual questions are measured in three dimensions. Affect of service measures the interpersonal aspect of service, such as empathy and responsiveness. An example is willingness to help users. Library of place measures how the physical environment of the library is perceived. Uh, for example, community space for group learning and group study. And information control measures the content and access to information resources. It includes types of content, convenience, ease of navigation, et cetera. An example of this is the electronic information resources I need. There are 22 core questions, and there are also five optional questions, five information literacy questions, as well as three general satisfaction questions, three library use questions, and up to three demographics questions, as well as a free text comments box. In 2010, we introduced a shortened version of the survey called LiveQual Lite. This is a customization that you can apply in stage one, where you select anywhere from zero to 100% light, and respondents will randomly receive either the short or long survey according to the percent you select. The median completion time for the long survey is about 10 minutes, and the median time for the light survey is a little over five minutes. Each light questionnaire includes eight of the core questions, one optional question, one information literacy question, uh, two general satisfaction questions, three library use questions, and all of the demographics questions um, that the library chooses, as well as the comments box. The core questions use a triple Likert scale where users are asked to evaluate a statement such as library space that inspires study and learning, and to give three ratings, the minimum, desired, and perceived. The perceived rating represents the level of service that the respondent believes is currently provided, and the minimum and desired ratings offer context for that perception. Minimum represents the minimum level of service the user would find acceptable, and desired represents the level of service that the user personally wants or their ideal level of service. LiveQual can be run in multiple languages. When you register, you'll see language choices, choices based on your region. And then in your survey dashboard, you'll be able to preview the survey in all available languages. There are four steps to running the survey. When you log into your institution's account, you'll be taken to the survey dashboard and that will display the information you need for your current survey stage. Pre-launch will be your customization stage. Stage two will be monitoring your survey progress. Stage three is closing the survey, and stage four is post-survey tasks and results. When you click on the link to configure your survey, you'll be taken to a page with a series of tabs across the top for customizing various aspects of the questionnaire. If your library has previously run live calls, the choices you, make, you made in your last survey will be carried over to this year. And you can decide to keep these features as they were on your previous survey, or you can change them. 
The first tab you'll see is the customization tab where you can upload a logo, establish, establish your light percentage, um, enter your dates, and choose your demographic items. If you choose to award incentive prizes, your questionnaire will include a box where respondents can optionally enter their email address. You can select up to five optional questions in the Optional Questions tab by selecting them from the existing bank of questions or by adding your own. If you choose to submit your own, they must be in the triple Likert format, and LiveCloth staff will moderate the questions before adding them to the database. This usually takes a day or two. LiveCall has standard sets of position and discipline options, and you can customize these labels with your local terminology. Your results report will break down your findings by user group with sections for each of the categories, and we will go over this in more detail later. On the questionnaire, these categories are further broken down into subgroups, which are the response options that your users can select. This is how it will look on your configuration screen. Your subgroups must match to a reporting value. And then here's a view of how this item looks on the survey questionnaire. Only the user subgroup options, not the parent options, can be selected. On the next tab, you'll see branch library options. You can enter the response options for the question, the library you use most often. This question is optional, so if your institution has only one library, you can leave this item blank. The same as the position question, you can use your local terminology to map to the standard list of disciplines. Too many choices can present challenges to users, so we recommend no more than 16 disciplines. And in your results notebook, there will be charts showing the number of respondents from each discipline. In this example, as with the position options, you'll be able to enter custom text in the left column, and these must map to a reporting value in the right column. When you've finished configuring your survey, it's time to preview the questionnaire and launch. The preview survey URL does not collect data, but it gives you an opportunity to test your questionnaire in different settings using different platforms and web browsers. Once you launch, you can't make any changes to your configuration. After you open your survey, you'll receive the survey URL to distribute to your users. If you need to know the URL in advance for creating promotional materials, we recommend opening a few days or more before you announce it to your community. In stage two, you can also monitor the number of responses coming in by date, time of day, branch, discipline, and position. And you can also view and download the comments. In your results report, ARL provides an analysis of how well your respondent sample represents your overall campus population. To do this, we ask you to fill out what we call a representativeness questionnaire, where you will, be, will, where you will provide population data for your user groups and discipline areas. The representativeness questionnaire becomes available in stage two, and it's based on the customizations that you make in stage one. In this example, you'll see a representativeness chart where the blue line shows the population in each discipline area as a percentage of the overall campus population, and the red line shows the number of respondents. In this example, the lines track fairly well, indicating that the distribution of respondents by discipline is representative of the campus overall. At the end of your survey run, you can manually close your survey from the survey dashboard. We recommend keeping your survey open uh, for at least three weeks or longer, and the system will ask you to confirm that you want to close. This is an irreversible step, so make sure you're ready to close. As soon as you close your survey, some of your survey data is immediately available on your dashboard. There will be three CSV files, the raw data, the options key, and the response key. These can be read in either Excel or SPSS. You'll also see the comments and the incentive emails list. There are also some optional questionnaires, the post hoc questionnaire, where you can provide information about your survey, such as sample size and number of emails sent, as well as the evaluation questionnaire, which uh, is where you can give feedback about your life call experience. Your results notebook will be available on the survey dashboard and in the LiveCall data repository, 
approximately two weeks after you close your survey. You'll receive an email notification as soon as the report is upload, uploaded. The notebook contains sections for overall undergraduates, graduate students, faculty, staff, and library staff. And within each of these sections, you'll see a demographic summary, a core question summary, local questions, general satisfaction questions, information literacy outcomes, and library use summary. LiveQual scores have three interpretation frameworks. Interpreting the perceived scores against the minimally acceptable and the desired service level is what we call the zone of tolerance. You can benchmark against peer institutions via the data repository and analytics, as well as through norms. And you can benchmark longitudinally, which is the ability to know how your library is changing over time. For each question, the averages of the respondents' minimum and desired scores form the zone of tolerance. In this example, that's the gray box. And it's bounded on the bottom by the minimum mean and on the top by the desired mean. The adequacy mean, represented here by the orange bar, measures how well the library is meeting users' minimum expectations. The adequacy mean is calculated by subtracting the minimum mean from the perceived mean. So a positive adequacy mean shows the degree to which the library is exceeding those minimum expectations. And a negative adequacy mean indicates that the library is failing to meet minimum expectations. If, if you have a negative mean, it means the orange bar would display below the gray box. And these scores would be noted in the results notebook with red text. The superiority mean is calculated by subtracting the desired mean from the perceived mean. So this is the gray area above the orange bar. The superiority mean is usually a negative number, and it indicates the library's room for improvement. If a library exceeds desired expectations, the perceived score would fall above the zone of tolerance, and the superiority mean would be positive. And if that happens, uh, this chart would show the orange bar extending above the top of the gray box. This is another view of the same concept. In this example, the mean of the respondent's minimum scores is 3 and the mean of their desired scores is eight, and the zone of tolerance is that five-point range in between the two scores. The perceived mean of six falls within the zone of tolerance, indicating that the library is exceeding their user's minimum expectations. The adequacy mean is three, and the superiority mean, which is the measure of the room for improvement, is negative two. Radar charts are another example you'll see in your results notebook. These give you a snapshot view of the dimensions. Each spoke in the wheel represents one of the core questions. Most charts will display blue and yellow, which indicates that the perceived score falls within the zone of tolerance. Green indicates that perceived is above the desired, and red indicates that it's below the minimum. This is a close-up view of the radar charts and zones Yellow shows the superiority gap, the distance from perceived to desired. Blue shows the adequacy gap, the distance from minimum to perceived. And green and red show scores above the desired and below the minimum. Once you close your survey, you'll have immediate access to the raw data and the comments. The results report will be delivered within two weeks. And you can find your survey results in the data repository along with the comments and raw data files, as well as the group notebook. You can compare your data in the analytics portion of the website, where you will be able to compare the aggregate data against that of other institutions in your same survey years. You can also generate charts and view and download the data. You can conduct peer benchmarking via the Analytics Pages Data Explorer tab. You'll select your institution and years, generate your stats, and choose your peer institution. Here are two examples of the charts and tables you can generate in the analytics section. You'll be able to view the charts and the data tables as well as download the data. Qualitative analysis of the comments is another way to use your results. You will have access to the comments immediately upon closing the survey, and you can download them as either Excel or text files. A simple way to begin tackling your results is to determine which services need attention by ranking services with the highest desired scores and or taking a look at the adequacy and superiority gap scores. 
The DM score model combines these three scores into one and allows stakeholders to easily interpret the results. Michael will talk, will talk about this a bit more in detail in the next section. And then the right column of this slide highlights some additional ways to look at your results. You can look at the top five most desired services, individual user groups um, through a lens of awareness, or explore one or more particular questions by discipline and user group. Communicating your results is a criti critical component to putting the results into action. These need to be communicated clearly to your stakeholders, and be sure to consider the needs of different user groups. Faculty needs, for example, may be considerably different than undergraduate needs. Determining whether library services are meeting user needs or not can be tricky. In some cases, it may be necessary to implement new marketing strategies in addition to changing or adding services. And I've included a couple of links here for further reading. The article in the second bullet point contains a detailed description of the DM score model that I mentioned. Now I will turn it over to Michael Maciel, Senior Data Analyst at Texas A&M University and Live Call Super User, and he'll give some practical advice on running the survey and interpreting the results. Thank you, Angela. Um, as Angela said, my name is Michael Maciel, and I work at the Texas A&M University Libraries. Uh, today I'd like to present to your group some recommendations on setting up, running, and analyzing the Live Call uh, survey and data. At the end of the presentation, I will talk about some of the projects that we have completed as a result of reviewing data for, uh, for and from LiveQual. So one of my first recommendations is, is the population sample. Uh, one of the questions you may be asking yourself is just, do we survey the entire campus or do we survey a, a random sampling of it? And my recommendation is, is that if you're not running a, a survey annually, that you uh, invite everyone to participate in the survey. And don't forget that you have other populations be besides uh, your faculty and students. You have researchers and clinical staff, uh, university administration, and the library staff itself. I, I would recommend you consider using local questions. Uh, sometimes uh, you'll have a sense of an issue uh, that you particularly want to address at your campus and, on, and in your library, and this is a great way to do it. Um, one of the questions, or one of the options that you'll be given in the survey when you set it up is what percentage of the survey do you want to conduct in the light version, and what percentage of the survey you want to conduct in the full version. Now, the full, sur full version will take considerably longer to complete, whereas the light version won't take as long, and you'll, you'll probably get more respondents that way, but you necessarily won't get as many uh, questions, full, the full 22 core questions that you would from the light that you would from the full. So you really got to talk about, do you, do you want as many responses as possible, or do you want to look at the full 22 uh, core question uh, perspective uh, from your uh, campus and from your survey participants? Uh, before you get before you start your survey, here's some recommendations. One, meet with your subject specialists, the people that go out in the field and meet with the uh, students and with the faculty, and let them know in advance that the survey is coming, and give them some talking points about the survey. Uh, word of mouth is is one way to generate participation. Uh, meet with your public service personnel, uh, the people at your circulation desks. Uh, interlibrary loan desk and, and desks like that. Again, word of mouth uh, and them mentioning it might, uh, might imp uh, improve your participation rates. Be sure that the entire library knows that you're conducting the survey because you never know what point of contact a staff person uh, is going to have with, uh, with a student or with a faculty member. So don't look at just your public uh, service personnel, but look at your technical behind the scenes personnel as well. Uh, also do a follow up, send an email to your library personnel so that they can read that. And again, have some bullets to refer to when talking about the survey. And then share the survey schedule and marketing materials with everyone, just so that when they start seeing, uh, especially the marketing materials, signage, uh, table tents and items like this, that they don't, that, they know what's on them, 
and it doesn't take them by surprise. Uh, my scheduling recommendations is that we generally do the survey in the second semester, not the fall, but the spring semester, and we generally do it mid-semester, uh, typically either after or before midterm. Uh, the length of the survey, as Angela mentioned, to do it more than three weeks. Uh, we've actually had better response rates by conducting it over a 45-day period uh, and just sending out an occasional reminder. You don't want to send too many reminders out, but you do want to send uh, reminders just to, again, increase that participation rate. Uh, check also with your, your, your campus to make sure that your institutional-wide survey is not conflicting with another survey. Uh, we conduct uh, student uh, assessment uh, surveys like uh, NESTI and SEIRU, and one thing that we make sure is that the inv invitations to participate in those surveys do not conflict with the live call invitation. Uh, when appropriate, uh, send out different emails with different email content to select user groups. We have one um, email uh, uh, text that we send out to undergraduates, another's, another type to our master's, PhD students, yet another to our professional degree students like uh, our medical doctors and our uh, veterinary uh, students. Uh, we do send out a separate one for faculty in the last rendition. Uh, the last time we ran the survey, we sent out a separate content to researchers, uh, administration, and and in some cases, we highlighted certain colleges, for example, the College of Nursing, which we've had a history of low participation rates, where we've addressed you know, specific email text to those user groups. Be sure to keep the emails brief. You, uh, if you print out your email, it should not extend beyond the page uh, and preferably three quarters of a page. Uh, I'd recommend you use bullets as opposed to full sentences. Uh, when you send out that email invitation, uh, give, them, give, your give the people you're inviting a reason why to participate. List the service improvements that uh, are important to the user group, and then also emphasize that user input drives um, improvements. The, the more that they participate in the survey, the more we're going to be able to deliver exactly what they're looking for. I'd also recommend, recommend that the invitation come from either the dean of your library or the director of your library. And in, and in saying that, I also recommend that you set up a separate uh, email uh, address for the dean. Otherwise, when people start responding to the dean's email, you might just blow up uh, her or his email box. And more to the point, you want to be able, as a survey administrator, to be able to look at those comments and address those comments. And uh, I don't know that many deans that are going to give you access to their uh, individual email uh, account. So set up an alias for something that you have access to. Um, I would recommend you begin the survey on a Tuesday or Wednesday. Uh, deliver it mid-morning. Uh, email schedule, send out an initial invitation. A first reminder, again, uh, on a Tuesday or Wednesday. And then a final reminder on the Wednesdays of the week that the survey is scheduled to end. Announce the survey will end on Friday, but keep it open through the weekend just to catch any stragglers. Uh, what you see here on the right side of this slide is uh, the, the marketing uh, image that we use uh, throughout the uh, survey uh, um, period. Uh, we've created table tents that we put on study desks and at public service desks. Uh, we in addition to this, the survey URL that ARL provides, we actually created a user-friendly email address, and ours is librarytamu.edu slash survey, so that people don't have to keep looking up and down to type in numbers. Um, ask your subject specialist to send out announcements about the survey. Uh, use any listservs that you have that are, are uh, campus or university-specific. Uh, use library and, institu and institutional electronic signage. Use social media if you have it available. And again, uh, use table tents at the library study tables and library service points. While the survey is being conducted, you will have the ability to look at the comments as they come in. 
and the comments will be identified by user group, uh, first year student, second year student, uh, assistant uh, professor, associate dean as examples, and also by college. If the responses are, are uh, disproportionate, by, by that I mean that you're not getting as many uh, uh, participation, uh, not getting the participation numbers that you'd like to see, consider changing your email reminder uh, text content. Uh, then make sure that your response rates have peaked and are declining before you send out email reminders. Uh, don't send out uh, reminders while your uh, participation, participation rates are climbing. Um, one thing that we do is that we also monitor the comments and whenever a user um, mentions uh, an individual libra a librarian or an individual library department by name, uh, I will send out a, a, a congratulations email, a kudos email to that individual or that department. I will also go up the chain of command copying the, the, the supervisor and the dean as well. And then we coordinate with the dean so that when I send those out, the dean then follows up by sending a further congratulations for, you know, getting this kind of uh, notice. You'd be surprised about what this does to generate, you know, your own people out there marketing um, uh, for participation in the survey. Uh, a lot of these comments that are, uh, that name specific librarians are actually used in faculty evaluation. So around this time that we do conduct the survey, you'll see the faculty members going out there and promoting this just so they have something to put in their evaluation. There's a practical application to this. Uh, after the survey is done, um, some of the areas that you'll have data to analyze will be from the live call analytics for your library. You'll also have the ability to compare yourself to other libraries. Uh, you'll have the raw data itself to look at as well as the comment text. Uh, some of the types of analysis, and I'm going to be going through this in a little bit more detail, is a breakdown by category for year, trends, comments, and so forth. I'll, I'll, I'll address those in the upcoming uh, slides. Uh, Angela showed you a copy of what the graphic representation of the data looks like. I've come up with my own uh, through Excel way of uh, 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 visualizing the data. I, basically the same version as what Angela showed you, except I use a dot as opposed to a bar within the uh, zone of tolerance. I've also uh, uh, giving you some definitions here to use. Priorities are your top desired scores. Your top perceived scores are what uh, you uh, are your successes. Your satisfaction is a ratio I call AGR, which is your adequacy gap ratio. And then your concerns are your bottom AGR scores. And then um, in the left hand of this slide, I've given you some of the formulas and some of the uh, the criteria to use to determine when something is a success or when something is an area of concern. Uh, and this goes back to what Angela talked to you also. Uh, but I, what I did here is give kind of a mathematical version of, of explaining what, what this data uh, can be used for and, inter and how it can be interpreted. Uh, Angela mentioned top five lists. I, I definitely use them for the purpose of this presentation. I used a top three list by priorities, successes, and then concerns. So the first column will show you what is important to your user group, and then you can carry that over and see of those priorities which ones your library is currently succeeding at, which ones your library uh, is an area of concern that your library may want to work on. Uh, the core question organization, there's, there's 22 core questions, and what I've done is I've, I've broken them down into six different categories. Uh, that's customer treatment and job expertise under effective service, under information control, information resources, and information accessibility. And then library is a place of study. There's three categories, the library environment overall, individual and group study related questions, and then question, a question related to the equipment that your library provides uh, your users. Uh, here's some of the examples of the analysis that uh, I talked about and that Angela talked about. Here's one that compares for a big question, a library web site enabling me to locate information on my own. And what I've done here is compared uh, undergraduates to graduates to faculty. And you can see that with undergraduates, 
uh, where the dot is, is it's within that zone of tolerance, so they're, they're, they're pretty much satisfied with the uh, ability to locate information on, on their own. Because that dot is uh, over uh, halfway up that zone of tolerance bar, you can say this, this is a success. You'll look at the graduate students, that dot is within the zone of tolerance, but it's in the bottom half of that zone. So even though your, your graduate students are satisfied, there is some area for improvement. And then on the faculty, you look that that dot is below the zone of tolerance, which is a demonstration that faculty are not comfortable with uh, being able to locate information on their own. Here's another analysis where I've broken down the analysis by, by uh, user group and then by college. I believe this is for undergraduate. And again, what I've done is the first uh, bar shows the, response, uh, the responses for all user, for all undergraduates, for all colleges. And then I broke it down by college. And then the final bar is where I compared our results to uh, um, our ARL um, um, members. So that not only can you look at how these scores by college vary to uh, the uh, institution's overall score, but also to other institutions. Speaking of which, uh, one of the things uh, that will uh, be important to y'all, if, if, especially if you're doing this in a, cons in a consortia environment, is being able to benchmark, which Angela mentioned. And here you see uh, a longitudinal trend uh, for the question, print or electronic journal collections, I require for my own for faculty. And you can see over the years that our score has gone from uh, in 2003 when we weren't meeting faculty needs to 2015 where we were meeting those needs, but because that dot is in the lower half of that bar, there's still areas of improvement. And then I've provided a trend chart here for the ARL perceived scores also. So it shows that compared to some of our ARL um, other members, uh, our scores are slightly higher. So uh, it's time for pat ourselves on the back. Uh, we did, I did an analysis by AGR, which again is your satisfaction um, value. And what I'm looking for is changes from year to year uh, where the satisfaction either increased or decreased uh, from the previous year or increased or decreased from two years. Uh, what I'm particularly looking for is where it's decreased over a two-year period. Uh, you are going to see some fluctuation from year to year, but if the decrease is uh, two years, then that means that you're headed in the wrong direction and you may definitely evaluate uh, what, uh, what you're doing to address, in this case, dependability in handling user service problems. Uh, I've also done a comment analysis. Uh, I don't use Atlas TI. I actually have a, a, a code, um, a comments code um, book that I use to, uh, in Excel to know uh, how comments are related or how they're categorized. And you can see here that library places is, is one of the most important functions for undergraduate, whereas with graduate, uh, library is a place and information accessibility share equal importance. And with faculty, it's information accessibility that's the most important. Uh, here's that comments code book that I was talking about. And here's how I break down the comments, not only by your broader areas, effective service, library's place, information resources, information accessibility, but subcategories within there. So if I want to drill down and find out, you know, how the comments uh, are for a particular area, for example, marketing or the way our reference or general treatment, uh, I, can, I can pull out those comments using a sort function on Excel. Uh, by the way, just uh, regarding comments, the general rule is that for, for you should get about 50% of comments for uh, your participation number. So if you get 1,000 people participating in the survey, you should get about 500 comments. Uh, here's another example, library usage. Uh, this is, again, for undergraduates, even though I didn't mark it that way. How many people visit the library premises? 84% uh, visit within at least a month. How many use the uh, web resources? 72%. So you can see that whereas, you know, 
both the library webpage and the premises are important, uh, more undergraduates are going to the building itself versus uh, going to the virtual library. Uh, this is the one thing that I, I want to talk about when we talk about uh, uh, just the impact that live call can have is evidence supports funding. I can't tell you how many projects we've had funded by the university just because we can refer back to the live call uh, survey findings and say, look, this is what our users say is important, and this is how we want to address that uh, particular issue. Uh, just quickly, just to go over some examples here, customer treatment, we've provided a standardized method of uh, how we greet and um, talk to our customers at our public service desk. Jobs expertise, I've listed some examples here, uh, all in one area or another dealing with professional development. Uh, in many cases, we moved away from the uh, uh, librarian out of, uh, just out of uh, uh, the MLS school and, uh, and have hired people that have had experience. Uh, and we've also provided a new clinical and instruction faculty track as opposed to a, a tenure track if that's applicable to your organization. Information resources, uh, again, I'll let you read through this. Accessibility was our big issue and our biggest effort these days has been on doing web usability studies to track how uh, people uh, when they open up the home page of the library uh, website, how they go about looking for information on their own. Library environment, um, two, two slides worth of library environment stuff. We recently completed uh, over the last uh, 10 years about a $15 million renovation on all our libraries. And here's just some examples of things that we've done. This is the library environment itself individual and group study, uh, and then equipment. And with that, I'm done. Uh, so thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you, Michael. That was, that was just in incredibly helpful to, um, to hear all of your really you know, practical experience um, gained over many years of, uh, of familiarity with this survey. Um, We'd like to open it up for questions from, from the audience now. Um, you, there's a chat box in the lower left corner of your screen, and if you type your question in there, we will uh, pose it to Michael or Angela. Um, um, and there is one question um, waiting now from Michael. Um, can you talk about how often Texas A&M runs li the live call survey and um, whether you use the same local questions every time or if you change them? Uh, we're actually in the uh, middle of a transition. We used to conduct the survey annually, and as a result of that, we would do random samples of students and faculty. Uh, one year, we would sample all the uh, science and technology faculty. The next year, we do the liberal arts and business faculty. But we're moving toward a once every three year model. And in fact, we'll be conducting the survey this coming March um, uh, to begin that new cycle. Regarding the uh, um, Local questions, no, we do change them every time we run the survey. Again, what the local questions do is, is try to highlight a concern at that time. Uh, the last uh, uh, live call survey that we did, uh, we emphasized uh, liter uh, information literacy uh, classes. And uh, for this survey, we're actually going to spend some more time on web usability issues. That's a, a good way to keep uh, keep the survey current for for uh, what's going on in your library um, in a particular year. Um, Angela, other libraries, um, some consortia will run surveys every two two or three years. Yes, uh, yes, there is. Most libraries, I would say, run it every few years. Uh, we do offer discounts for running it every year um, or every two years. Um, a lot of, I don't know, some institutions run every three years or every uh, four years, so they would uh, not be hitting the same population if they do it more than three or four years apart. Um, I do, um, Evie, you had a question here, uh, and um, Amy, I'm sorry for jumping in, but uh, yes, we do use the, uh, the survey for accreditation reports and visits. In fact, at the uh, 
2018 Library Assessment Conference, I did a whole presentation on how to use LiveQual for assessment reporting and visits. And I think that, that presentation is on the LiveQual website in the publications section yes. um, if, if people are interested in, in exploring that further. Um, Liza has a question, um, is it possible to manipulate the wording of the question taking into consideration that we work in an ESL environment? Um, the wording of the questions themselves, the core questions, cannot be changed. Um, the, the translation, however, um, we could potentially work with you on, on a translation if, if there's a mistranslation issue. Um, but generally, the, um, the core questions can't be changed. And the, the optional questions are what you can submit to be worded however you want. So long as they're in that triple Likert format, uh, the beginning text is uh, when it comes to, and then question text, my minimum desired and perceived rating is. So it sort of has to fit within that format uh, to, to, to be on the survey, to make sense within the survey context. Um, Evie asks if um, we could share a link to Michael's presentation uh, um, on using LiveQual for accreditation. And when we share the recording with, with Alex at, at Amacall to um, pass on to you all, um, we will also send along that um, resource and, and any other resources that, that we think might be useful. Um, Michael, you talked, um, uh, and Angela demonstrated a little bit, um, the LiveQual's analytics module, which is where libraries can interact with their data to compare with peers, to um, compare across user groups, um, discipline areas, to uh, create custom radar charts and, and download subsets of data. Um, Michael, could you talk a little bit about how you use um, analytics in your um, and you're using your live call data? Uh, well, the university has several uh, aspirational peers. We use uh, uh, ARL institutions as one uh, peer group. Uh, we also use, um, you know, all these Texas universities as another user group. So by having that analytics option or the subscription to analytics, uh, we can pretty much pick who we want to compare ourselves to either individually, institution to institution, or, uh, and, it, and this, this is very germane to the fact that I'm talking to a consortium group right now, is you could gather all your data both inst by institution and by uh, the consortia as a, as a total uh, to compare how your, your library is doing compared to uh, the consortia or to individual uh, institutions. I would say one thing just as a reminder is that if you are going to compare yourself to, if you do use analytics and you are going to compare yourself to another specific institution, there are certain guidelines on how you report that other institutional data. Uh, and Amy or Angela, I'll, I'll let you explain that, but I, I do want to offer that cautionary note about not uh, identifying that institution by name. That's true, yeah. Um, we um, have a, um, guidelines on how to use data that um, emphasize that um, um, the, the scores are just one measure of how people look at, at, um, at library services, and they're not an absolute measure um, that doesn't necessarily that mean that one library services are better than another. Um, it, it's a measure of, of the, the satisfaction, and so you need to take a lot of external factors into account when comparing um, scores. And then we also ask that people anonymize um, libraries in, in comparison. Um, uh, just uh, as, as a further note on that, uh, I believe that uh, Greece has an uh, IRB human testing uh, standard that they have to meet when they send out surveys. And one, one of the issues is that we do want to anonymize not only our data, but that of other institutions just to meet those uh, internal review board guidelines. Um, 
Evie has some questions about the analytics module. Um, was wondering if it's a feature of LiveQual or if it's an additional um, service. And, um, and Angela can explain mm -hmm. the, uh, the options there. Yes, um, analytics is available to anyone who runs the LiveQual survey. It's not an additional service. However, um, there is an additional service for having more access to all of the institutions who have run. So when you run the survey normally, you will have access to any of the aggregate results for institutions that have run in your same survey years. So if you run the survey a lot, as Texas A&M does, you automatically have access to all the years um, and all the institutions who have run in those years. If you are only running in 2019, for example, you will only have access to the other institutions that have also run in 2019. For an additional fee, uh, which is $1,000 per year, we offer a subscription to um, the Lab Quality Analytics, uh, which gives you access to all of the institutions in all years. So we recommend doing that if you are planning to do um, a lot of benchmarking work, um, especially after you run a survey, perhaps in an off year. Um, and it's something you can subscribe to at any time, so you don't have to do it the same year that you're running a survey. Um, but you do have to run a survey first before you can subscribe to that. So it's not just open to anyone who hasn't run a survey. Hopefully um, I do want to second that. Um, uh, because Texas A&M no longer does annual surveys, but does them, you know, on every, uh, like a three-year cycle, we do uh, pay for that analytic subscriptions even on the years that we're not uh, conducting the survey. And one reason for that is that when we do benchmarking, uh, when I'm comparing our university to another university, there may be a situation where another university ran the uh, survey in 2017 and we ran it on 2016. So by having that analytic subscription, uh, I can compare those two institutions, whereas if I didn't have that option, I wouldn't be able to pull that data for the other uh, uh, library. Exactly. Thank you. Um, Michael, switching gears a little bit, do you um, at Texas A&M use um, incentive contests to um, promote participation in the survey? Um, yes, we do, and we, we actually have to be very careful about that because of new tax laws. Um, what we've been offering over the past few uh, surveys is we offer five um, Amazon Fire tablets, and um, we make sure that the Fire tablets are under $100 again, for tax purposes. And the, there's also a catch to that is uh, the federal government here uh, requires that even if, it's, even if it is an incentive under $100, the, the participants or the recipient has to pay tax on that. So uh, we try to make sure that people know that you're getting this you know, $100 fire tablet, but you're going to wind up having to pay $2 in tax on it or whatever, whatever the tax rate is. But we do offer incentives. Uh, I did one year where I did not offer an incentive. And the one question I kept getting on comments uh, from the people that had taken the survey before was, what's your incentive this year? So uh, if you run this survey you know, consistently, like on a three-year cycle or, or less, um, and you do offer the incentive, it's something that you, you, you almost lock yourselves into for future surveys. But uh, again, look at what your tax codes are regarding incentives before offering them, but I would recommend that you use them. Thank you, Michael. Oh, one other thing. Um, w with regard to that, uh, and Amy or Angela, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe there is a resource link on LiveQual that gives a list of the incentives that have been offered over, uh, offered by various libraries throughout the years. Is that correct? That sounds familiar. Um, I will look for that. I'm not sure exactly where it is. Um, and there's been a, a large range of options that I've seen just in the past couple of years that I've been working with the live call survey. It's anything as small as a piece of candy or a few pieces of candy for completing the survey to um, $5 gift cards to larger items like iPads. I'll look for that and we'll send it around with the, with the slides as well, with the recording. 
Yeah, there were some really good ideas on that, if I recall correctly. Um, with regard to that, too, Angela, um, we, um, Lightqual also um, uh, has a repository of other um, examples of marketing materials on the website. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, and definitely spend some time looking at that, that web page with those links. Uh, I'm really proud of the marketing um, design that we came up with, but there's some genius other ideas out there and some very cute and effective ideas that uh, can really spur your creative uh, uh, thought process when coming up with your marketing campaign. And while, while we do provide some examples of what other libraries have done, LibQual um, doesn't provide marketing, marketing materials for libraries to customize themselves. Although we do have a bank um, of, of images online where you, you can download the survey logo. Um, um, uh, but that said, um, if I recall correctly, uh, that website does identify the institution that was providing those marketing ideas. And it's been my experience in previous years that they're more than willing to share their um, graphics with you. Um, Evie asks, um, please explain how you differentiate the light and the full version, and what percentages do you recommend and why? Are you throwing that question at me? Um, uh, who would like to take it? <laughs> um, I guess so, yeah. Michael, could you talk about what you've done at, at Texas a and Oh, yes, and she specifies Michael. Uh, gee, thanks. Uh, I'll tell you that's the point of contention this year. Uh, in previous years, we did 50 and 50, uh, 50 full version and 50 light. And I actually want to, there's, our participation rate generally is anywhere from 10 to 25% of the total population. So we, we don't, you know, it's, whereas with most surveys, you know you're a success if you're getting an over 50% uh, response rate. You don't look at that with live call. You look at your representativeness chart to determine survey validity. But uh, this year, what, we're, what I'm trying to promote is 75% full and 25% light, just because I, I prefer to get that entire 22 core question perspective as opposed to only eight, the eight question perspective that the light does. But um, and, and saying that, there's several people here that uh, want to see a higher participation rate versus uh, uh, that full 22. So uh, uh, like I said, it's a bone of contention right now. And I know that's not an answer, but at least let you know that, you know, that's where I'm leaning and why I'm leaning that way. Yeah, it's hard to, it's hard to say. It really depends on what the priorities are for the institution. Um, and like you say, Michael, you get a higher response rate using live call light, uh, 100% or, or, or any percent. Um, but then you don't have as much data for each question um, as you would if you had run it all, all along. So most institutions, I would say, do a mix. Um, there is, I think lately there have been a lot running 100% light. So it really just depends. Um, but I think a mix is a, is a great way to start out if you haven't run a survey before to see what kind of participation rates you get. Um, Edie asks if there's a support community to help with questions and, or a listserv, um, mm -hmm. which we do have. Angela, would you like to talk about that? Yes, we have a lab call listserv, um, and uh, we can definitely get you added to that. I don't remember off the top of my head. I think we have a link on the live call website, which I'll have to send around to join. Um, but uh, we can also manually add you, um, anyone who likes. If you send an email to livecall at ARL.org, that's me, and um, I, can, I can help you out with that. We'll also send this link around when we send out the recording and the slides. And then Evie, um, uh, in addition to that and anyone else um, that's out there, uh, my, um, my email address is on my slides, and um, I, I really am a live call geek. So feel free to email me if you have any questions as well. 
and we've just put up the uh, slide with our emails, so um, please feel free to, to contact any one of us um, on, the, on the slide here. Um, I have another email address, which is just Maciel at TAMU. You don't have to put the library in there. Thanks, Michael. Well, we've just about come to the end of the hour, um, and it looks like we're there are no more no further questions coming in. So, thank you all very much for joining us. Thank you, Michael and Angela, for um, all the good information. And um, we will be sending the recording to the uh, consortium within the next week. Thank you.